Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Tasha and Katie. So, uh, yeah, as uh, Tasha introduced, my name is Madhukar. I'm a lead solutions engineer at Ultera. Uh, and I have a quick uh, QR code for my LinkedIn profile if you guys want to connect. Uh, I will be happy to talk to you guys about, about anything related to Kubernetes or cloud native infrastructure. Uh, so, in today's talk, I'm going to talk about uh, discover and secure your APIs in news. So, let's get started. So this is the agenda which I have put uh, for today's session. So first of all, we want to start with what do we mean by secure your APIs? As I said, there are different meanings to it. So we wanted to clear it on what do we mean by secure your APIs and why somebody has to secure their APIs. And we'll also talk about uh, what are the challenges uh, when people decide to secure their APIs? What, what are the challenges they will face uh, to secure their APIs? Uh, and What's our take on how somebody has to do, uh, has to secure their APIs is what also we'll talk about. Uh, we have a few diagrams which basically explains how we do it today. Uh, and then we'll also talk about what are the possible use cases. And then we're going to have a live demo uh, at, a, at the end of the session. So, okay, so what do we mean by secure your APIs? So, in this slide, I just wanted to introduce you to the definition of secure your APIs through a whitelist rule, right? So what I've done is I've taken simple example of two services, service A and service B. And I have defined a set of rules uh, which basically explain what, what do you mean by securing it? So the rules are like service A can talk to service B uh, and service A can talk to service B only using HTTP get method. And then again, service A can talk to service B with only HTTP path, which is for slash card. So when these rules are enforced, that's when we can call the service B APIs are secured, right? So for this example, I'm just I'm just taking two services, but I'm sure in your staging environment and in your production environment, you have tens and thousands of services. So similar whitelist rules must be created to protect all the service to service communication. So that's what we mean by uh, when we say secure your APIs. So why somebody has to secure those APIs? So I, th I think one example which we can take is Kubernetes, right? So whenever a user tries to access a Kubernetes resource using Kube, Kube API server, so basically Kube API server is responsible to authorize that API request. So what it does is it, it evaluates all the attributes against the policies which it has, and depending upon the policies, it basically allows or denies a request. So Similarly, like a user has to be authorized, all the micro microservices also needs to be authorized to access any other service APIs. So why do we need to do it? We need to do it to minimize the risk of unknown software vulnerabilities, because I'm sure as there are tens of developers in your team writing codes, they're introducing known bugs. Some are known, some are unknown, and there are only few APIs which are tested. So we want to make sure that the APIs which are tested are also, are exposed and not tested are protected. Uh, and also we want to reduce the attack surface. So for here, we can take an example of, okay, you have a Kubernetes cluster, you have deployed a service known as, like multiple services, definitely. Then you have a service like a, a email service, which doesn't basically need to talk to any other service. There are a few services which consume the email service, but it doesn't have to talk to other service. If the email service gets exploited for some reason, then the attacker can actually increase the attack surface and maybe try doing some malicious stuff which you don't want to happen. And the other thing why you want to do is your SecOps team might come up with like compliance and auditing requirements, then pretty much you don't have an option and you have to do that, which is securing your APIs. So these are the reasons which, uh, which I think is uh, will, why, why you have to do a, like why you have to secure your APIs. So, Next, I'm gonna talk about the challenges when it comes to securing your APIs, right? So first thing which comes to anybody's mind is, okay, can we do a manual way of maintaining this whitelist rules? So you can, if, if your services are few services and you have a small Kubernetes clusters, definitely. But when you have hundreds of services and you have like five to 10 Kubernetes clusters for various reasons, then doing it manually is definitely error prone. And also whenever you have to upgrade your services, you are basically adding new features, which means you're adding new APIs. So every time you need to do that, you need to maintain that manual list. 
and whenever a new integration happens maybe with a new project new app or a new saas then it will take a lot of time for you to learn what is the client sdk using what are the different apis which the client sdk is using how can you protect your new system so it will take a lot of time uh, and you also want to basically securely deliver these apis across multiple environments right so the common scenarios would be you have a hybrid cloud environment you have a producer and a consumer sitting in different location so you want to secure those apis and also deliver those app apis to a different location and then uh, all about multi cluster doing a multi cluster service discovery and enforcement at multi cluster level is going to be hard right uh, so one of my colleague yakub had a session uh, today morning and he talked about application fleet management at scale that basically explains how we reduce the burden of managing hundreds uh, so that gives you the view of what we have for a multi kubernetes cluster management and then all you want to have is like how we can configure at multiple cluster levels and also observe like observe the uh, the the rules count observe the services across these multiple clusters is going to be very difficult to do when it is when it is at like when you are managing like tens or fifteens of kubernetes clusters so what's our take on securing apis so i have like in my previous slide i have mentioned so many times that manual is definitely not uh, not a way right so we want to dynamically discover all the active service to service communication graph constantly keep learning api endpoints when i say learning api endpoints what i mean is you have a service one which is talking to service two you have to understand what what path it is using what method it is using what are the common methods it is using and constantly learn those api endpoints and also you need to have a layer 7 policy engine which can understand these rules and of course uh, this is very uh, implicit but i'm going to say it anyways that you need to have public apis to automate the discovery of this service-to-service uh, -service communication graph and, and also enforcing so that you can integrate with your existing GitOps pipelines or uh, existing workflows like app onboarding. So you can do a lot of steps using public APIs. So uh, what I've done is I have come up with a diagram which basically explains how we do discovery of services currently. This is running in our production right now, right? So uh what i like in most of the terms i'm going to use world console and global controller interchangeably uh, so that's where uh, that's the place where we are hosting all our SaaS services and then uh so here in this diagram uh, i'm just showing subset of services which are related to today's uh, discussion and i'm leaving all the rest of the services so all the configuration comes to the global controller onto the config server so config server actually has multiple roles like one of the role is it has to do the dynamic discovery of services. Uh, so what it does is it, it basically watches the Kubernetes API server and basically tries to look for events of creation of a service, creation of an endpoint, so that it can create a, a source mapper DB. So it knows what is the service and what are the pod IPs associated with it. So every time it does that, it basically configures the, uh, the proxy what we have in the data path and the other things what config server does is it also configures other services like the detection engine uh, what we have on the node now whenever service a wants to talk to service b the communication happens to the proxy the proxy basically looks at the flow it looks at uh, the source ip because of the source mapper dp what it has it can basically tell what source in what service instance it belongs to and basically labels that access log to a particular uh, service instance and it does similarly for the destination now the proxy has a log to understand what service basically spoke to what service now these access logs are sent to detection engine the proxy is also is also basically um, managing multiple metrics so basically every time a rule is hit for service a and service b it increments that metrics so we have a prometheus cluster which is sitting in the uh, in the cluster which basically scrubs for these metrics from proxy and detection engine so detection engine does a lot of uh, things uh, like anomaly detection and stuff like that but for today's talk what i'm going to only talk about is how it helps uh, basically in, in discovering of the services 
So one thing you have to note about the detection engine is it basically it's getting updated API endpoint periodically from the learning engine, which is sitting on the uh, global controller. And I'm going to talk about the learning engine in, in the next slide. So it is getting those updates through the config server onto detection engine. So now every time it looks at the access logs, it really knows it can map, it, it can actually pass the request path and look at, see that where the, where, which API endpoint it matches to, and it can label the access logs. Now, we don't want to send all the access logs which are generated by a proxy because it might be in hundred thousands or two hundred thousands. So we want to sample it. So detection agent also is responsible for sampling it and sending it to Fluentd. So this is what happens for when when it's for workflow of discovery of services at a node level. Now at a global level, so we have multiple clusters which are sitting. So we have a single global controller which basically is uh, uh, like where we have where we have Cortex, which is basically scraping for metrics from multiple clusters. And then we have Elasticsearch to which the logs are being sent. Uh, as I introduced Learning Engine in the last slide, so the roles and responsibilities of Learning Engine is to basically go through the logs and learn all the API endpoints for one service to another service. So Learning Engine is basically continuously learning all the new API endpoints which are getting generated. And Data API Server is responsible to look at the metrics provided by Cortex and create this service-to-service -service connectivity graph. So once you have service-to-service -service connectivity graph, what you need to know is what are the API endpoints associated with from one service to another service. So that, that also is exposed by Data API using a, a public API. So this is what we do on the global view. Now we are talking about policy enforcement. So of course we are creating a layer seven policy through our SaaS and that gets uh, configured onto the config server at the node level. The only difference you see from the previous picture to this picture is we have introduced a new component known as policy enforcer. So what happens is whenever the config server configures the policies, and there is a new flow from service A to service B, uh, the proxy basically asks the policy enforcer to authorize that flow. So the policy enforcer looks up the policies and it basically, depending upon the attributes, it basically can say whether the flow is authorized or the flow is denied. And the, pro and the proxy basically ensures that it is enforced at the data, uh, data path level. And whenever a policy is hit, like whenever policy enforcer is matching a particular matching it to a particular policy a metric is being incremented and prometheus is again scraping for those metrics and that's how it basically said it gets sent to the sas now what are the possible use cases for it right so anywhere you need to discover deliver and control an api there you would need this uh, api security so pretty much for all the service apis like for the public front ends for the websites if a developer is basically integrating with a newer service, newer SaaS, then he should have an easy way to look and discover what are the API endpoints, what are the services talking to which service and what API endpoints they're using. Uh, that is also needed for compliance and compliance reporting and enforcement. Uh, to also deliver is like securely deliver these APIs to multiple environments, like for example, uh, you are developing something on your laptop and you need access to some private resource which is sitting somewhere. So you, you, somebody has to deliver those uh, APIs securely onto, the, onto your laptop. So there are a few projects which are already there, which is inlets, cloud native tunnels, which addresses these issues. So for those kind of use cases also, we would need uh, security, securing those APIs. And the next is, uh, what are the third party partner access to APIs? So for all the third party and partner access to APIs, you only want to limit few of the APIs to have uh, access to those third, uh, to, to those partners so that they only query few of the APIs and the rest are still secured. So those are the possible use cases. So in next, we're gonna just go through the demo, uh, uh, demo topology, how it looks like. So for the demo topology, what we have done is we have created two environments. One is a prod environment, and the another one is a staging environment. So both are hosted on AWS uh, Cloud right now, and they are managed through our uh, uh, old console. So what we're gonna do is we'll go through 
uh, go through our console and show the different namespaces we have created and how we are managing different clusters. And we also will show the service mesh uh, graph. It is basically shows the service to service connectivity and what are the API endpoints. So we have written a small CLI tool basically that uses the public APIs to do a service to service uh, communication discovery. It basically returns all the uh, service, -to service to service uh, communications. And then we'll use the same CLI tool to apply uh, whitelist policies. Uh, so what, but one thing we need to note is what we are doing is we are actually discovering it from staging environment and applying it onto production. So that is also one of the use case uh, people, people try to do. They, they want to test it and make sure everything is fine on their dev environment, on staging environment. They want to make sure that there are right traffic hitting uh, the right nodes. They discover that uh, API endpoints and apply that rule onto the production. And uh, of course, now it's the live demo time. So let me slowly move from my slides to uh, the UI. So uh, we have multiple namespaces. So one is hipster prod and the other one is, um, um, we have one more, which is hipster stage. So if you look at the graph here, so this is basically explaining you what are the different services and which services is talking to which service. There are around 12 services, which is forming this application. Uh, I'm gonna talk more about this application, but as you can see, these are the nodes, like for example, this is the front end service talking to checkout service, uh, all the pub from public people are accessing front end. If you click on these edges, then you will understand what are the API endpoints discovered for it. So if you look at the API endpoints, you would exactly know what path they are using and what method they are using. Uh, and there are much more information, but right now for this demo, it's, the, uh, it's not appropriate. So I'm not bringing it up right now, but there are much more information when we get onto the API endpoints. So now with this graph, we have, we know all the services, how they are talking to each other and what are the API endpoints they are using. So the demo application we are using is hipster shop. Uh, it's a sample e-commerce application developed by Google. Uh, so it's an open source application which we are using. And this one instance is uh, deployed in prod, the another is instance is deployed in staging. Okay, let's go to the terminal. So first thing what I want to show is, uh, show you all the resources which are deployed in those Kubernetes clusters so that you can understand uh, uh, what, what application we are running, what are the services which are exposed, stuff like that. So as you can see, this is a, a hipster prod cluster uh, where we are running uh, like around, I think there are nine to 10 uh, deployments and services related to it. And then we have another cluster where we are running similar, uh, similar application. So one is for staging and the another is for uh, production. So one more thing which I want to show is we there is no pre-configured policies for in, in production environment. So I'm just gonna list all the policies and as you can see, there are nothing here. So it, it is starting clean slate, which I mean by which I mean that all the services can talk to all every every other service and using every other API uh, API paths. So now, what I want to do is I want to take an example scenario. Let's say that an attacker has access to email service, and then he wants to use email service to basically expose other malicious services. So for that, uh, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna run some command here, which basically is ex ex executing it into email service, and it is trying to access uh, the card service, and it is basically trying to add a product. So right now, if he if he does it like that too from email service, he is able he should be able to do that because there are no uh, securities securities which we have enforced right now. There are no whitelists which we have enforced. So as you can see, he redirected it to card service. The cookie is set and everything is set. So this communication is allowed right now. So this is what we want to block. Right? So we want to reduce the surface. So if you have access to email service, you shouldn't be accessing any other thing or you, sh you should be only accessing what is what is what you are supposed to access and not all other services. So this is what we want to stop from. Uh, so for next step, I'm using a, a CLI tool, which 
which is nothing but a wrapper tool, which is uh, which is basically using the exposed public APIs of Altera and uh, doing service discovery and enforcement. So now we are what we are doing is we are discovering all the APIs endpoint paths uh, for hipster stage namespace. So right now it is going and querying all the uh, all the services and it is looking for API endpoints between those services. Sorry for it. So as you can see, what it does is it basically has uh, listed out the table. It tells you what is the client, what is the server, what method you are using, and what are the collapsed URLs. So by this, it means that public wants to talk to front end. It uses it is using HTTP method post. And the only valid URLs it is supposed to talk on is cart and checkout, cart checkout and product page path. And uh, similarly for front end and all other services, it has basically listed out, listed out all the URLs which it is supposed to talk on, right? So in the next step, what I'm going to do is I'm going to you discover the same thing, which is uh, what is the client, what is the service, what is the method. And what is the, what are the API paths and convert those into uh, uh, layer seven policies, what we call as service policies, uh, and then enforce them. So, one thing which you need to keep in mind is so we are discovering it from hipster stage, but the policy is enforced at hipster prod. So as you can see, it's creating multiple policies so that it can enforce that particular uh, particular whitelist rule. So we'll go through one of the rules and explain what is happening there. So, for example, uh, let's say that the checkout service the checkout service is talking to cart service, and it is allowed to talk only using these paths and, and nothing else. So that rule is basically enforced. So let's look at the service policy list and service policy rule list. As you can see, there are multiple service policies and service policy rules are created to enforce that uh, application, uh, to enforce that whitelist rule. Now let's basically validate the same thing what we did to basically add add a cart or add multiple products onto a cart using email service. There might be a slight delay here. Okay, as you can see, uh, it has replied with 403 forbidden. So now it is not able to add a product onto a cart, which, which it was anyways not supposed to do. Because the APIs were not protected, it was initially doing it, but we're now with the uh, the layer seven policies or the whitelist rules which we have apply, which, which we have applied to which uh, the API access has been forbidden. So this is what I had for the demo. And then, uh, so here are my contacts. So uh, so you can reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, we have contacts for Voltera as well. Uh, and we are hiring right now. So if you have uh, any questions related to any of the job job positions which we have on the site, please reach out to me and I can, uh, I can, I can discuss with you. Uh, and now we can take some question and answers. Great, thank you so much, Madhukar. Sure. That was a really smooth demo. Can I just say, while we kind of get the Q and A set up, that was like that was <laughs> so solid. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Some days it works. Some days I know. Not so much. <laughs> I don't. I know it. So what do you, I, I'm curious because sometimes sure. you see people adding, adding in security more as a reaction 
right? Instead of like proactively, do you have something you tell those people? Like, how do you get people to include security uh, as part of their development process rather than like reacting to problems later on? Yeah, I think one of the security, I think one of the principal, principal thing about security is it should not be an afterthought. afterthought. It should be well planned before so that you can protect it at multiple layers. And there are different options available for protecting different resources. So you should go through it on your, uh, like it, it could be authentication, making sure that all of your services are MPLS enabled. Uh, you should like, like what we showed in the demo, you should also authorize it. Uh, and then like if there are WAFs, WAFs which needs to be enabled, then WAFs needs to be enabled. So there are multiple layer steps and the principle of security is you need to do it like before, like right before in the, maybe in the pre requirement phase, you need to discuss it, architect your uh, platform in a way that it's not been, it, it's not getting attacked. So you need to take all those precautionary measures before, definitely before development uh, and come up with the right uh, architecture for it. Yeah, I think one thing we often see people overlooking, for lack of a better word, is the including security as part of their architecture, as part of like the actual planning, right? Yep. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the most common things. That too, where that is for companies where technology is not their primary product and they are just using technology uh, for maybe for IT. So that's that's where most of the people neglect security. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely they shouldn't do that. Tasha, do you have any questions? Um, I, I was just having like a moment of extreme empathy for the whole build security in as you do your product development uh, story. So um, yeah, 100% uh, agree. It's interesting to me that um, even as we were, I think uh, as, you know, kind of making fun of the whole DevSecOps thing because like shouldn't it just be DevOps right like there was like a real pain that was coming into everyone's view with that movement because things are kind of getting glued on at the end or have some sort of checklist at the end instead of really looking at the beginning of your service development for how you're gonna make everything secure to begin with so yep all right well, thank you again so much, Madhukar. Uh, that was great. Will you be around in the Slack so if people have questions later? Yes, definitely. Uh, they can reach out to me on Slack. I'm on the Kubernetes community Slack group, so you, you guys can reach out to me. Great. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you.